Okay, welcome everyone to our sixth um, lectures at home session. Today we have Malte here, who is talking about smart contracts. Hey, I'm Malte. I'm from Campus Karlsruhe. And before we start, I want to tell you about an experience of mine, which is related to recommendations letters. Recently, I had to get a recommendation letter for an application to study a year abroad. This process was very old school. I had to ask the professor to write the letter and then they couldn't just send it to me. No, they had to print it and I had to pick it up in an envelope and you know, I had to keep it sealed and then send it off to the, um, to the uh, Institute, the International Students Office. The contract here is that the sealed letter validates for the International Students Office or the company you are applying to that the recommendation letter was not manipulated. In my opinion, this is not the world we live in today. I have all of my documents digital. I almost didn't even know what to do with an envelope. So keep that in mind. We'll come back to that later. But now let's start. Topic I'm gonna talk to you about is my contracts. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that especially in technology and in this time where uh, social inequalities are a hot topic, it is important more than ever to create a world where power is equally distributed? Well, how might we do that, you ask? Today, by uh, learning about smart contracts and a fundamental change in computing, we will see one of many solutions that might in introduce this change. So let's learn more about smart contracts. First, let's take a step back. Smart contracts are not something new. They are a rather old idea. Nick Szabo defined the smart contracts as with the goal in mind to have ideal security by formalizing relationships between parties. His idea or his vision is that smart contracts are contracts that are embedded into everything that is digitally connected and managed and has a digital value. He thinks that by embedding the smart contracts into the hardware or the software, the contract, breaching the contract comes so expensive that the um, contracts between the parties are more secure. As we can see, smart contracts in general are just the abstract concept. From this on, a couple of years later, we have now blockchains. So. Let's look at smart contracts on blockchain specifically. This means just like smart contracts are just a digital ledger and not all digital ledgers need to be uh, blockchains, smart contracts are an abstract co concept and not, not the only implementation for smart contracts is on blockchains. However, Today, I'm going to take a look on smart contracts and on blockchains because right now at this stage, they are the only implementation of the abstract concept. First, I don't want you to worry about what are blockchains because while it is important, it is not as relevant to understand smart contracts. However, I want to give you a brief overview. Blockchains are a set of technologies that have existed before, like cryptographic hashes, proof of work, or in general, consensus um, mechanisms, and distributed computing. On blockchains, transactions that are initiated by users are collected into a block and then stored in the distributed database that is the blockchain. To ensure that the, um, to 
prevent the double spending problem so that a transaction can only exist once, a consensus mechanism is used. A consensus mechanism validates that only one node in the network can um, uh, accept the transaction or the block and put it in, link it into the blockchain because the chain is a, a hash of the previous block stored in the new block. This way, once a block is changed, the hash changes. And so the blockchain becomes invalid. Smart contracts are today usually developed in a higher level programming language. From there on, the code is compiled into bytecode that can be interpreted by the blockchain software. For example, Ethereum is a popular blockchain that has a bytecode. It can run distributed on the network. Once we have the smart contract compiled, it is sent to the blockchain network. So here you can see a graphical representation of a network. We have different nodes and they all store the same representation of the blockchain, which are blocks linked together and the blocks themselves contain transaction right there. Once the smart contract is sent to the blockchain, the um, nodes, just like when you send a transaction for a crypto, uh, crypt for cryptocurrency, store the smart contract into a transaction. This means they create a new block on the blockchain once enough transactions are there. And right here, we can see that there's the new um, contract. Now, a contract is a little bit different because it is not just a transaction in the sense of I, Alice sends Bob a certain amount of uh, um, coins of a token. Instead, there are three parts that are important. First, a smart contract has an address because a smart contract is code that we want to execute. So we need to know how we can call that code. Secondly, smart contracts contain some logic. So we have the different functions you can call on the smart contract. And thirdly, the smart contract needs to contain state because we want to change the behavior based on its state. So when we call a function, maybe the function will transform the state and the next time we call the function, a different output is achieved. Because the blockchain is immutable, the logic and everything cannot be changed. This provides the value that all the nodes on the network can be sure that nobody manipulated the code and turned it into a malicious attack. However, this also provides the risk that once you deploy a contract, you cannot fix it. You have to deploy another one. So when developing smart contracts, be sure to not include bugs or at least do the most you can to prevent them. Secondly, we have state. State is also stored on the blockchain. This means once state changes, we have a mutable record of all the changes that were made and we can um, see what functions were called on a smart contract. So let's have a look. We have a user right here. And they once they call the smart contract, they can send a transaction to the address of the contract. And the data inside the transaction is interpreted as the parameters for the function. And then all the nodes on the network will execute 
the code they have stored at that address with the given parameters. And once they come to the result, they, they do the changes on the state. And by having the smart contracts be um, deterministic, that means with the same input, they provide the same output. The nodes can check with each other if they got the same output and can thus ensure that the credibility of the execution is given. So you cannot go and become a node of a blockchain network and execute something totally different, get all the coins that were provided with the transaction and kind of run away with them because the other nodes will notice. For me personally, and maybe you have the same feeling right now, blockchain and smart contracts and specifically seemed always so far-fetched. I didn't even know what to do. They seemed kind of like magic. This is why the next section is, I think, the most important. Now I will show you a quick demo and hands-on of how you can code your own smart contract. Maybe you're not as advanced in coding, or maybe you are. Either way, I hope this will give you an, an insight into how smart contracts work and that they are definitely no that there's definitely no magic involved. So for this demo, I want you to think back about what I told you about in the beginning. The situation with the um, applications and how I had to get an um, recommendation letter. Instead of sending the letter in an envelope, maybe we could upload the digital document somewhere and then ensure by hashing the content of the document that everyone can upload a copy they receive of the document and verify that the document hasn't changed and is still the original. This way, the author of the recommendation letter could write the document, store its session on the blockchain, send the documentation letter to untrusted parties, and once the office, who is the receiver of the recommendation letter, gets the document, they can verify by hashing the content that the document hasn't changed. So let's take a look. I stop the presentation here for a bit. And go into Visual Studio code. Um, quickly, before I forget, if you want to start programming your own smart contract, because really that's what my goal is, for you to be able to go ahead and even if it's the simplest smart contract on Earth, go ahead and write your own smart, co smart contract. So the first thing you should do is go ahead and search for Visual Studio Code and download Visual Studio Code for your operating system. And then go to the marketplace. So I pressed on extensions and search for blockchain. And right here, the second search result, the blockchain development kit, you can install and then it will install to your Visual Studio Code instance. And that's all you need to set up then you will be ready to go. The smart contract we are going to write today will be written in Solidity and we will deploy it to a local um, Ethereum blockchain. Keep in mind that there are so many other high-level programming languages for smart contracts and different networks. So there's just a breadth of possible technology combinations. And I simply hope that this will give you an insight into one of them. Now, we have a Visual Studio Code instance, and we are in a, a simple folder. And the first thing we'll do is we we'll hit uh, the command, and we we'll search for blockchain and create a new Solidity project, create a basic project. So now we need to select where we want to create the project, and now it's heading off creating our project. 
wait a second until it is done. Um, maybe to talk a little bit about Solidity. Solidity is the most popular um, high-level programming language for smart contracts. It is kind of interesting, so I warn you ahead. Um, the syntax can be a little bit off-putting, um, but you will get used to it, and it is orientated from the syntax wise on in Java and uh, JavaScript, kind of a little bit C, C++. So this is re really interesting, but if you know any of those languages, you might feel a little bit familiar. Otherwise, another interesting aspect to notice is that while Solidity is the most popular um, smart contract programming language, uh, researchers have also identified that this is the one where you'll be most likely to write bugs or include bugs in your code. So if you go back and remember what I talked about earlier before, maybe it is not the smartest language to write smart contracts in if you can easily fix them once you have them deployed. So another um, aspect to smart contracts is their security and there have been research or there are research attempts to um, validate, to do formal automated formal validation of smart contracts. So you can um, define what your smart contract should do and you have a tool that verifies that your smart contract do, does what you define. And also there's a whole other uh, category of smart contracts which are smart contracts that are, or uh, programming languages for smart contracts that are not Turing complete. So even if you don't have a background in computer science, Turing complete basically means that you can do anything, a computer or an algorithm in the sense as instruct, um, instruction or yeah, um, a program can do. And if you have non Turing complete, you have some restrictions so, for example, when writing blockchain uh, smart contracts for the popular blockchain uh, Bitcoin, the Bitcoin blockchain, you don't have um, uh, Turing complete um, programming languages, but rather a small set of instructions. While this prevents you from being able to write everything you want, it also helps because there are no loops or such, and this makes it very easy to. Um, verify a smart contract and what a smart contract executes. So to recap, another um, possibility of writing smart contracts could be in the future to have domain specific limited languages and not the breadth of um, programming as we know it from traditional computing. So as you can see, the generator is finished and it's scaffolded as a project right here. You don't need to worry about all those configurations for now. So first you'll see that it created a Hello World project. However, we will write our own. So we create a new file, call it file registry and the solidity uh, and file ending as SOL. And we can also delete the Hello World one. The first line we will specific, specify the version for the compiler we are going to use. So in our case, version 0.5. This is uh, crucial because um, this tells the uh, compiler that you can it should not use a version below that. So once they're, um, if there are breaking changes introduced to the compiler, you can ensure that nothing weird happens when you compile the smart contract. And then um, we create a contract. And this is much like, think of it as a class. Even though you might be inclined to say object oriented, another word might be contract oriented. Because while it is very similar to objects and classes, 
and you can initiate smart contracts in the sense of objects that you can create. It is not object oriented in the sense that you have everything very modular and tons of objects flying around in maybe the Java virtual machine or such. Um, in addition, it is um, very common to have smart contracts define only core logic. So they are not an entire application with UI and everything. As a result, there's a lot of work to do around the integration of smart contracts into systems. However, let's start. So what do we need? We want to store a file or better yet, not the file because never store large files on a blockchain since they are simply too big to distribute across the network and the blockchain would grow or would blow up. So we only store the hash of the file. To do that, we need some sort of data structure. So we create a, or we define a struct. We call it file struct. And we want to know the author of the file. And in addition, yeah, I don't, I can't think of anything else right now. Maybe we need to add something else. Then let's have a look. What do we need? Possibly two functionalities. First, we want to be able to register files for a certain author so we can hash the content and store it on the black blockchain. Secondly, we want to be able for other parties to verify documents by sending a document and comparing it to the documents that we have stored on the blockchain. So as such, we have identified two functions. First, we need one for registering the file. Worry about that later. And one to look up a file or find the author of the file. Okay. Let's see how we implement them. First, we expect some parameters. In our case, um, why not the most efficient? We want to get the content of the file. So this is really basic. And I warn you, if you're an expert in smart contracts, the idea behind is to get started and have a relatively easy to understand example and not the most efficient and com um, complicated smart contract. And then the second argument we need is the author. We want to know who wrote the, the file, the document. Uh, once we have them, we uh, can compute the hash functions, the hash for the um, for the document. So hash will be bytes that we get back, and this we we use a provided function. It is built in, and it is a hash function that we can apply to the content, or rather, we cast the content to bytes, because this is what the function expects. Now that we have a hash, so a hash means we put into in uh, some data, some bytes, and we get out some bytes, and we are, we have ensured that. If you put in the same data, we always get the same result. If there are no collisions, we will be also able to um, compare. Uh, we will be also able to, once the file or the data we put in changes, the smallest change in the bytes will make a huge impact on the hash. This way, we, we, we are able to get the content of a document, calculate and compute uh, a unique value on the content, and later on see if we put in the same input, we need to get the same hash, then we know, okay, the document hasn't changed. Now, what do we do with the hash? We need to store it somewhere. For this, we create a map. 
So this is just the data structure like you might know from other programming languages and its keys will be bytes. So because we have the hashes in bytes and then we will want to store the information on the file we just computed the hash on. So those are our values and we give it a name, file lookup, and there we go. Now we need to add more fields to our struct because the hash map will be initialized from the start. This is unique to uh, blockchains. So we have a hash map filled with all the possible values for the keys and some random um, values. They are mapped to some random values. So because we need to know if the key we are requesting later on is actually a file we uploaded beforehand, we need to do some indication whether or not this file struct is actually registered by us or is just initialized. So for this, we will use a simple Boolean. Then we go back to our registration function. And now we have the file hash and we have somewhere where we can store it. So let's go ahead and take the lookup table or the map and add the key file, the file hash key. We want to set the author to the value we got as a parameter and secondly we want to set the is registered file property and right now we are registering a file so we can be sure that the file is registered and we say true oh the look up here is not capitalized so let me fix that all right now you might ask if I register a file and register the same file again or have a, even have a hash collision, that would be interesting as well. We would overwrite something we have previously um, stored. So we cannot be sure anymore um, whether or not the document hasn't changed. As such, we need another function to check if a file is already registered. This function expects an hash. And the simple thing it, is, it does, it checks in the lookup table by lookup whether or not at the file hash, whether or not the file hash, uh, the file at the hash is already registered. If so, it is registered. If this is true, uh, false, we have not yet set it to true and the file is not registered. We can use this to check before we insert the file whether or not it is registered. So if it is registered and we give the file hash, we calculate it here. If it is registered, we don't want to override it. Instead, we return, and this will ensure that all previous state modifications will be rolled back. So the state of the blockchain is consistent again. And we give it an error message. File is already registered. All right, this is it for the first function. We have a function to register a file. Now on to the second function. Here we expect to get the content of a file. And what we want to return is who wrote that file. So previously someone hopefully registered the file and we can tell now by hashing the document. So let's do that just like we did before. We calculate the hash. As you can 
can see this is the same same step as up here. Now we want to don't want to insert the file. We rather want to check whether who is the author of the file. For this, we have our lookup table right here. Remember, we stored the author once once we, once we registered the file. So we go ahead and return file lookup uh, at the hash key and get the author. Now, just like before, we need to check first if the file is already registered. However, this time, if it is registered, we are good to go. We can re receive the author. If it is not registered, we need to return saying that this file is not registered. We don't know who wrote that file. Now, this is looking pretty good, except there's a lot of red scribble. So we do the easy trick and, oh, okay, what is it saying to us? We need to add some um, need to tell it whether or not the function is public. We have the same problems here, even though we can do this as a private function because it does not need to be called externally. We only need it in our own functions. And what do we need here? We can do it public because we want to provide, provide this function to others. Now, uh, what do we have here? Oh, right. We need to capitalize this one. And okay, in the formatting. Oh, we, we need to tell it right here what we want to return. So um, as the return value, uh, we return whether or not it is registered. So now the other functions, yeah, they don't worry about that anymore because now they have the right type. And as well here, returns ring of author. And we need to provide it where the string is stored so on memory. This one we can also, this is specific to blockchains um, because if we would code an endless loop into our smart contract and somebody would run it, the entire network would be stuck on executing our endless or our infinite loop. As such, people have come with, uh, up with a solution. It is called gas and this means that each operation needs um, a specific amount of gas and the user initiating a transaction will have to pay for all the um, gas the uh, in invocation of a smart contract takes up or rather they can specific, 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 set a specific limit so it is ensured that once the, uh, the run runs out of gas the smart contract will not continue executing anymore and um, we prevent endless loops. However, since different operations take off different um, computing resources, we can specify this one as view because no state is modified. We only read here. And uh, this um, makes this function uh, easier to calculate and in the end cheaper. Now let's the same goes for this one because here we also only read, but it doesn't apply to the register function because here we change the state, the status, the file lookup. So there you have it. This is your smart first smart contract. Now if you 
uh, want to go ahead and compile the smart contract, you can go into the migrations folder, deploy contracts, and this is getting into the realm of there needs to be some configuration around the smart contract itself to be any any useful, anything useful. So we load the file registry smart contract, maybe rename this. Our smart contract doesn't have any arguments. It could have a constructor, um, constructor um, method, but we don't need this. And as such, we don't need any arguments. And we tell the surrounding um, infrastructure to deploy the smart contract. And then with the Visual Studio Code extension, you can easily right click and build the contract. And then you could, once it is finished and built, you can also on a smart contract, right click and deploy contracts. And then you can select a network or even a local network. Um, however, I won't go into detail of this uh, because I want you to try it out yourself. And let's go back to the presentation then. Okay, now that we have a demo, or have seen the demo, let's move on with a little bit more theoretical talk. So, the application I showed you was all about documents and um, verifying data that is stored immutable on the blockchain. Now, there are other areas of applic for applications of smart contracts. And I want to give you a brief overview of what, what they are. The first one is called notary, notary. And this is where the category where our smart contract we just wrote falls into. These smart contracts typically store data persistently and they require the immutability of the blockchains. They try to solve real world problems like where you have to go and verify that you are an owner of a document. Second, and this is probably the most common application for smart contracts is finance. Now we have cryptocurrencies as an application of blockchains, but the world of finance is much larger than the money you pay with. So those smart contracts do not just distribute money, but they also manage and gather money. And in addition of certifying uh, the ownership of real world objects. For example, in finance industry, the stock market could be an application for this, where keeping track of trades today is a um, process that is very complicated because exchanges are separated into silos and it is hard for them to find the common ground on how they should exchange data. As such, this bureaucratic process could be much simplified um, through a blockchain and tracking trades there. In addition, crowdfunding could benefit from smart contracts because um, or rather, there have been actually quite successful examples, even though they also have a tragic ending, which is the DAO contract, where one could um, fund projects and the project um, owner would receive the um, money provided once uh, he fulfilled his part of the contract. However, uh, maybe you've heard in the news, it's quite a while back now already, but there has been a hack of the DAO contract because of some security vulnerabilities. And again, this is going back to the 
one very much important aspect which needs to be figured out, uh, security of smart contracts. There might also be some more fun um, applications for smart contracts. So not just all about serious business and money, because uh, smart contracts can be used to uh, build simple games. So I'm not talking about your next first person shooter. I'm talking about two categories. First, game of chance, like uh, dice, rock, paper, and scissor. You could imagine having the state on, shared on the stored on the blockchain and then different nodes on the ne network can play against each other and receive uh, a, crypt, um, a cryptographic token or bet cryptographic tokens. Secondly, games of skill. So the first one, you don't, uh, the first category is more um, related to um, to randomness and game games of skills are um, more where you have some um, capabilities. So for example, like you could think of uh, yeah, poker in a sense. Next up, another application are wallets. So I talked about uh, cryptocurrency beforehand. And wallets solve the problem of simplifying the interaction with the blockchain. So they handle keys which you need to um, authenticate on the blockchain. They can send transactions for you. They manage your money. And they can also be used to deploy and keep an eye on smart contracts that are of interest to you. And lastly, there are smart contracts that simply provide some functionality for other smart contracts to use. Those are library contracts, for example, for mathematical functions. Researchers have identified that most of the smart contracts deployed today are finance smart contracts and notary smart contracts. Now, there's not, not everything is rosy uh, in the smart contract world. There are some considerations one needs to keep in mind um, when developing smart contracts. So first, let's start with the benefits. Obviously, just like the aspect of smart, uh, of blockchains, you have trust between parties that actually don't need to trust each other. Because the um, smart contract is managed by the network and the consensus mechanisms of the blockchain ensure that you can trust that the execution of the smart contract is valid. Next up, smart contracts bring a huge advantage to automation and bureaucratic processes. Because smart contracts don't simply live alone, they can be connected to all different kinds of devices. Think of another very interesting topic, IoT. You could think of a future where we have a lot of data collecting um, IoT de devices and sensors and now for them to communicate, share data, and make use of the data, the blockchain could be used to, for example, as a trading platform for the data, or simply to ensure that the data a sensor produces can be trusted. So besides the bureaucratic processes, the automation aspect I just talked about is highlighted. Now, let's look at some disadvantages or things to keep in mind of smart contracts. Because even though, or no matter what people tell you, if they tell you smart contracts are the solution to everything, don't believe them. Nothing has the, 
responder solution for everything. Every technology has its niche and applications, but it also has its pitfalls. In the case of smart contracts, one of the most uh, obvious is speed consideration and performance or efficiency. Smart contracts are executed across the network and the data is stored on the blockchain as well. So on most blockchains, every node needs to store all data. As such, scalability speed and speed of execution is limited, which is why smart contracts only um, do small computations and are part of a bigger software system when, when in use. Next, this might be a little bit wondering, um, is privacy. And because, why, is, uh, why is this interesting? Well, often people think that blockchains, you are completely private because you are interacting uh, um, only to your keys, so you don't have to register your name. However, the privacy aspect I'm talking about here is we could store the author like we did before in the demo on the blockchain. However, everyone could know that you have written something. Now, maybe this is not critical when you say, okay, I can have my name up on the blockchain and nothing more associated with that name. However, there are other applications you can think of where you don't want to store sensitive data on the blockchain because everyone has access to it. And lastly, and this goes more into uh, defining smart contracts. While smart contracts do have the word contract in them, they are nowhere near to being close of uh, le legally binding. So they are not just, they are not like a regular real world contracts where you can go in front of court and um, have your, um, your, um, have your part of the contract uh, rewarded if the other party does not fulfill it. So there needs to be work done on the legal side, on the political side, to have a um, bright future for smart contracts. As such, maybe smart contract is the wrong, wrong word. As we learned, smart contracts are maybe not that smart in the sense of that they also only compute the instructions you give them. So this is, has nothing to do with machine learning or AI. Secondly, they might not even be real smart contracts, but rather it might be easier to refer to them as um, distributed programs. That's it from my side. Um, as a recap, we learned um, that the concept of smart contracts is not something new, that smart contracts do not need to be implemented on a blockchain. However, we looked at them, uh, how smart contracts can work on a blockchain. Thirdly, we saw a demo of a real world example where we can apply blockchains. Next, we um, learned about the um, applications and areas where smart contracts make sense. And finally, we also saw some considerations to keep in mind when developing smart contracts. Now, I hope that you could take away something about smart contracts and at least that they are not magic, that they are part of the future of computing, even though scalability is the um, big questions and there are unanswered questions and they are not a problem, problem solver for everything. If there are any questions, uh, I'll be welcome to, I'm uh, welcoming them. Otherwise, thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, Malte, very much for your talk.
Do the participants have any questions? Okay, it seems there aren't any questions, so if it's okay for you, we can end the session. Currently, we have no further talks in our backlog, so we go into summer holiday for a few weeks until the next speaker is available. Yeah, thank you, Sandro. It was fun, and I'm looking forward for the next topic. I hope you are too. See you then. Bye. See you. Bye. And for the rest, keep updated on our Lectures at Home webpage as we will keep the webpage updated if any further talks are into are in the queue. Okay, see you. Bye.